Welcome to another EduMed video and in this video we'll be talking about troubleshooting cardiac pacing on intensive care. We'll specifically be focusing on transvenous temporary pacing as it's probably the most common type of pacing that we do on intensive care for the symptomatically bradycardic patient who's acutely presented. We'll go through a little bit about what can go wrong. The general approach to a patient who's um, got a pacing box that's not working and then think a little bit about the different types of things that can go wrong with pacing and there's really only three or four things the first is output failure where the ge the generator of the pacing box just isn't giving a electrical signal enough to stimulate the myocardium failure to capture this is where the generator is producing an electrical stimulation to the heart, but it's not enough to cause mechanical capture, and i.e. causing a beat with the ECG changes concordant with developing a um, mechanical beat of the heart. Oversensing, which is a phenomenon whereby the pacing box itself is getting confused and thinking that the heart is underlying rhythm where it doesn't actually have any translation to mechanical beats. And finally, an RMT phenomenon, which is a potentially dangerous phenomenon that can cause VT and VF, but requires a appropriate setting of the pacing box to avoid this. Now, why do we care about pacing at all? Well, it comes but down to the fundamentals of cardiac output and Really, these are the two main equations that one should have in their mind when managing any patient from a hemodynamic standpoint on intensive care. The cardiac output is dependent on only two things. One is the stroke volume, and the second is the heart rate. And the product of both of those will give you the cardiac output. And cardiac output is really what we care about a lot in intensive care, and it's, it gives an indication as to the perfusion of blood to different organs and when we talk about shock states what we're talking about is inadequate perfusion to those organs. Now on the wards we don't have the luxury of having cardiac output monitoring and so we use blood pressure as a surrogate but bear in mind that blood pressure is cardiac output multiplied by systemic vascular resistance. So you can see how if your cardiac output drops for example your heart rate significantly drops then you can compensate with your blood pressure by increasing your systemic vascular resistance but it doesn't avoid the fact that your cardiac output is actually dropped so it's important to make sure that we maintain an adequate heart rate to maintain good cardiac output absolute numbers for heart rates isn't as important as a measure of cardiac output and the reason that's important is because if you th take a 20 year old marathon runner they may well have a heart rate of 40 or 50 beats per minute which is completely adequate for them because they've got a good healthy heart with a large stroke volume per beat. On the other hand, if you've got an 80 year old with significant heart failure with an injection fracture of only 10 or 20 percent and they have a heart rate of only 40, they may be significantly symptomatic as their cardiac output could have dropped as the stroke volume isn't able to compensate for the drop in their heart rate. So don't be fooled by blood pressure because you can artificially increase it by giving vasopressors such as noradrenaline. And the reality is we need to consider the cardiac output in patients. So those patients who are bradycardic with evidence of tissue hypoperfusion, say a lactatemia or organ dysfunction with acute kidney injury, confusion or derangement in liver function tests, do think about whether this patient has got a decreased cardiac output and how you can increase it. Do they need more fluids to increase their stroke volume? Do they need inotropes to increase their stroke volume? Or do they actually need an increase in their heart rate to get their um, cardiac output out? Now, this is one of the different types of pacing boxes that's out there. And probably the most common type that you will see on the intensive care. Now, of course, they may all look a little different, but the settings themselves are all fairly similar. And these are pacing boxes that we use for ventricular wires, which is the type of wire that we put in in temporary pacing for patients. Now, 
There's a lot more information about temporary transvenous pacing wires, the insertion of them and the management of them in another video. So please check that out on the um, on my channel. But in general, there's only really four things that you can change. And you can see those as the four dials here. The simplest of this is the dial to switch the um, pacer on and off. So in this mode, it's off. And then you can turn it and this particular pacing box has a, only a couple of pacing options and the most important one and for beginners and for when you're troubleshooting things VVI is the most commonly used and probably the one that causes the least amount of trouble in terms of interference and complexity but can give a reliable output whilst you get things sorted for the patient. Now the second simplest thing is the rate, and you can see that here, and you can dial that up and down, and you sometimes want to dial it down to see what the underlying rhythm is. So if the patient has an underlying heart rate of 60, and you've set it at 80, then you're going to obscure their underlying rhythm. So it's always worth, every time you assess a patient, dropping this heart rate down, and by doing so, seeing what their underlying rhythm is. You'll be surprised how often when patients get better from whatever their condition was that they brought them into intensive care, the underlying rhythm starts to come back. Now that might be through correction of electrolytes, correction of acidosis, or just reperfusion and time in the case of patients who come in with myocardial infarctions. The next thing that's most intuitive is the output. You can see that here. And you can increase the um, output as much as, or as little as you need. And the more you increase the output, the more electricity is given to the heart, and therefore the stronger the electrical stimulation is of the heart. And this is usually in volts, and you can see that you can turn it up and down. You can start off really low, so 0 0.3 is the lowest output that this particular box gives. You can go all the way up to 12 volts. Generally speaking, you want to try and find the minimum amount of electricity required, so the minimum output you require to cause mechanical capture. Now that's different to showing a QRS complex on the ECG. And often you need a slightly higher amount of electricity to actually stimulate a coordinated mechanical beat of the heart. Once you find that um, threshold voltage at which you cause a mechanical reliable beat of the you then want to try and set a setting that's slightly higher than that to account for the fact that the impedances might change over time if the patients move, the wire might move slightly and that may cause a slightly increased amount of voltage being required to capture a beat. Now the final style and the one that causes a lot of confusion for people but it's really actually quite simple is the sensitivity dial. Now the sensitivity dial is basically trying to monitor the intrinsic heart rate of the um, heart and assessing the electrical activity in the heart. And what you're trying to do is either increase or decrease the sensitivity. So the more you turn this around, the more sensitive it becomes. Now the way to think about this is, if you've got, say, a tiny electrical activity, the myocardium is very sick, it's not generating a lot of electricity, but it is generating something, you want to increase the sensitivity so the amount that it can detect that it then classes as a QRS complex. So if you have the, the dial on this side, where it's got a large millivoltage before it actually thinks, okay, this is a QRS complex, it makes the, the heart need to have a much higher millivoltage or amplitude to that QRS complex before the pacing box thinks, ah, oh, this is the intrinsic rate, I'm not going to give a, a pacing spike during this. So you can see how if you turn it all the way over to the other side and you make it really sensitive, so even the smallest, tiniest electrical activity, it classes as being its own, the patient's own intrinsic heart rate, you can run into a situation whereby diaphragmatic muscles and the pectoral muscles 
all those movements could potentially stimulate the heart into uh, the pacing box into thinking that it's the heart's intrinsic QRS complexes, whereas rea in reality it's just noise. So most of the time you want to set your sensitivity in that happy medium and it's sort of around about three to five uh, millivolts. That's enough for this pacing box to be able to sense the intrinsic electrical activity of the heart, but it's not enough for the patient to, uh, for the pacing box to pick up extraneous noise. Now, the more you turn it over towards the less sensitive side, so the higher the millivoltage, the less it's going to care what the heart is doing. Now that can be important because sometimes you can have electrical activity in the heart, but the heart's actually not creating a coordinated beat of the heart. And in those cases, you want the pacing box to sort of ignore what's going on with the heart. But we'll talk a little bit about the so-called R on T phenomenon and why it's important for the pacing box to always know what the heart is doing. Because if you provide a generation, an electrical impulse, at the wrong point in the QRS compl QRST complex of the heart, you can trigger VT or VF. So in summary, switch the um, pacing box on, generally have them on VVI, set the heart rate, set the amount of electrical stimulation that you need to stimulate a mechanical beat of the heart, and the sensitivity, which is assessing constantly the intrinsic electrical activity of the heart. I think it's worth just talking a little bit about the nomenclature of um, pacing boxes. Now, I've got a whole set of series, a series of lectures on permanent pacing boxes and about resynchronization therapies and about um, coordinating atrial and ventricular beats and so on. But for the purpose of this, it's worth just knowing what I mean by VVI. Well, the standard nomenclature is the first letter always stands for the chamber that's paced. So in a VVI, we talk about the ventricle being paced. Now, you know that's intrinsically the right thing, because if you think about the um, passing of a temporary wire, we pass it through the internal jugular or the femoral vein, and we place it so that it sits in the right ventricle at the apex. Now, the second V stands for the chamber sensed. So the same temporary wire, in addition to being able to stimulate the heart, also has some electrodes to monitor the heart. And particularly, temporary wires, we monitor the ventricle as well. Again, intrinsically, you know that's right, because there's no leads going off into other places like the atria. The final thing is what it does in response to what it's sensing. So say the... Um, pacing boxes sense that the patient has got an intrinsic rhythm and there is a QRS complex there. What does it do? Well, in VVI, if it senses the intrinsic rhythm of the heart, it just won't do anything. So it won't give the next pulse generation that it was programmed to do because the patient's intrinsic rhythm is there. And that's great because as the patient's own intrinsic rhythm starts to come back as they get better from their underlying condition, then the pacing box isn't going to continue trying to give pacing. Um, and especially if the patient's heart rate starts to come up above the rate at which the pacing box is trying to give it, again, the pacing box will essentially just go into a backup rate. So if the heart rate drops below that, it'll kick in. If not, it'll allow intrinsic rhythm of the heart to prevail. So it's worth thinking about troubleshooting because it's the, probably the thing that most intensive care doctors are most worried about when you've got a patient on the intensive care unit. And as a matter of fact, almost, when, if something goes wrong, it always goes wrong at night. The typical scenario that you have is that um, you're the intensive care registrar or SHO on overnight and the ITU nurse calls you over saying that the pacemaker doesn't seem to be working. The first thing you should always be thinking is, well, why is that pacemaker there? Is it that the patient's just got very slow AF, or do they have no underlying rhythm at all? So you can have some cardiac surgery patients who have no intrinsic pacemaker activity, so they've got um, essentially asystole as their underlying rhythm. That's really bad, because if that pacemaker isn't working, that's the only thing keeping them alive. On the other hand, if you've got someone with complete heart block, again, it can be scary, but actually 
these patients have an intrinsic ventricular rate, so you've got a little bit of time to sort things out. So, what do you do when the nurse calls you over to say the pacemaker doesn't seem to be working? Well, the first thing to do is actually to work out exactly what's wrong. And people underestimate just how important it is to get a 12 lead ECG. Now, on intensive care, almost every patient is on a monitor, and a cardiac monitor, with three or even 12 lead um, monitoring. It's important to actually get a physical 12 lead ECG because often what you find is that there are nuances there that will be missed otherwise. I can think of certainly a number of occasions where the pacing has been a little bit off and the registrar of and tried various different things. But in reality, the reason why the pacing started not to work so well is because the patient was having a massive MI. And the 12 lead ECG showed significant ST changes from the baseline ECG of pacing and uh, actually all that patient needed was revascularization. So really important to get the EC e ECG for the patient. You can miss things. It also tell you whether each beat is being paced because you'll see the pacing spike and then you'll see electrical activity afterwards. Bear in mind that electrical activity on an ECG doesn't translate to the patient having a heartbeat. And so you should always correlate the rate that's on the ECG to the rate that you're seeing on the arterial line trace, on the plethysmography trace, or by physically feeling the pulse, because they can be different if you've got lack of electromechanical coupling. Once you've done that, it's worth checking the circuit. And you can do this in any way. What I tend to do is I have a look to see at the chest X-ray, what the lead placement looked like. You will be surprised how often they've had a chest X-ray the same day for some other reason, and the leads don't look like they're in the same place they were when the um, temporary wire was initially floated in. Now, if that is the case, you've almost got your answer already, and that the leads have moved, and therefore you need to do something about the leads. Usually that's to call a cardiologist, or if you're experienced, to readjust the um, position of the wires appropriately. Now, I'd suggest for most people to use chest x-ray, but if you do know how to use echocardiography and you've had a look at where the position of the wires were before on echo, and I tend to always have a look on my first day or night that I'm with the patient, if you see with the echo where the lead is, very often you can see that the lead's flopping around, or if it's sitting nicely in the ventricular apex and moving nicely with the beating of the heart. So always check the lead placement. Second thing is to check the polarity. Sometimes the leads may have accidentally been disconnected whilst the patient was being turned. The nurses have hastily put those wires back onto the pacing box, but actually reverse the polarity. And sometimes by changing the polarity, so swapping around the positive and negative leads on the pacing box, you can also help with capture. And you will see sometimes the cardiothoracic surgeons coming in, especially with epicardial wires, and changing the polarity, and sometimes that seems to work. The most important thing is to check the connections are tight. This is probably the most common cause for failure of a pacing box, is the fact that the pacing wires haven't been inserted appropriately into the pacing box itself. So always have a look, check, and make sure they've been screwed on tight. If they've got an intermittent connection, you won't get adequate pacing. Now, some of the more complicated pacing boxes have both atrial and ventricular lead ports. Now, they give out slightly different modulations of the pulse and slightly different amperages. So be careful and have a look at the um, pacing box itself. Now, what I would suggest is that when you're first on the unit with a patient who has a pacing box, either when the cardiologist put it in, or cardiothoracic surgeons put it in, or um, if you're on with um, one of the consultants or senior registrars, please come up to us and say, can you just go through the pacing box with me? Because each pacing box is slightly different, and, uh, and you need to be familiar with whether which ports are being used and whether it's the right port for the right lead. Now, the real bugbear that I have with these pacing boxes is the battery. These batteries do run out and they should be regularly changed. 
Um, they do have a LED light to show low battery, but often as the um, battery fails, that becomes dimmer and dimmer and it can be difficult to see. So if in doubt, always change the um, battery. Personally, what I tend to do is actually change the whole box because that way I've eliminated a whole number of problems that could potentially be going on with the pacing box and then we can have a look at the battery and things at a later time. There should always be, at the very least, a spare battery at the bedside for pacing boxes, especially those patients who are 100% dependent on pacing box. But you can also have, um, uh, you should always have a second pacing box available. Now, I say should, I can't count the number of times people have had to run around to the cardiac theatres or I've had to run around myself and grab a pacing box because they've not got enough on the intensive care unit. But it's always worth checking with the nurse in charge at the start of your shift. Do they have a spare pacing box if anything goes wrong? That's especially important if the intrinsic rate of the patient is asystole. And that's very common in patients immediately post cardiac surgery. And then the final thing is to check the settings. So look at the rate, the output and the sense. Now, my general thing is when I do a ward round, I always make a note of the heart rate, the output, the sense and the threshold, um, threshold output that the patient needs to get electromechanical coupling and also the intrinsic rate of the patient. I put that in every time because then if you do come up with problems, you can not only see what the previous settings were, you can also then see what the safety margins were as well. Now, if you're ever in doubt, and sometimes we do change people onto different special types of um, pacing, especially if we've put in atrial and ventricular leads, um, or if they've got underlying intrinsic rate problems, or tachyarrhythmias and things. But if you're ever in doubt, always change your pacing box back to VVI. It is the simplest and most reliable method of pacing in an emergency. Then have a mental check. Now the sensitivity can be changed. It depends upon the intrinsic um, electrical activity of the heart. However, as a general rule, between two and five millivolts is about right. And you can, should be aware that as the patient moves, the lead can move even inside the heart, or as the inotropy of the heart improves, as it becomes a more well heart, it starts to beat harder. Again, you can dislodge your pacing wire. And so your sensitivity can change because if it's if the wire is touching more um, closely to the ventricle, you'll start to detect higher um, electrical outputs. Or if it flips off or moves away from the ventricular wall, the electrical activity it detects may be a lot lower. And so always have a look to see, maybe you're starting to oversense. Now, the first of the things that can go wrong is the so-called output failure. This is where the pacing box just is not providing an electrical stimulus there. You can't see a pacing spike on the monitor on the 12 lead ECG. So if you can't see an output, then it can only really be one of three things. Either a problem with the wire, a problem with the leads connecting the wire to the output generator, or a problem with the generator. So check each of those in turn. So have a look at the chest x-ray. Has the wire fallen out? Has it moved place? Check the lead connections from the pacing wire through to the output generator. Very often those leads can become loose or even fall out. If you've got an unstable connection, if it's not being screwed in properly, again, that can cause output generation failure. The battery is something to always think about. And the final thing is the oversensing. Is the, have you set the sensitivity too high for the um, pacing box and therefore it's detecting even small things like pectoral muscle movements as intrinsic cardiac electrical activity and so inhibiting itself. So check the connections, change the battery. The way I do that is by changing the whole pacing generator and then coming back and having a look. Increase the output. If the wire has moved, it might need higher output. So 
instantly put it up to maximum and then you can always slowly bring it down and work out where the threshold is for getting electromechanical coupling. If the threshold potential has increased a lot, um, by more than 25%, I would say, have a think about whether the wires have moved. Over time, the threshold potential does slowly increase because the myocardium becomes fibrosed, it becomes uh, used to having electrical stimulation there. However, the reality is that it shouldn't change by huge amounts and very quickly. If it does, then it's more likely to be that you've had a movement in the lead and that needs to be assessed with a chest x-ray, echo, and then speaking to a cardiologist or to an experienced person who can reposition the pacing wire. Now, the final thing that you can do, if you, if you think that the it's sensing wrong or there's a problem with the lead and it's over-sensing, you can change um, it, the pacing box to VOO. Now, remember again, the first letter denotes what's being paced. So the ventricle's being paced. The second is what's being sensed. And you can see here there's an O. What that means is it's not sensing anything. So by totally switching off the sensing, you're just telling the pacemaker, I don't care what's going on with the heart, just give the rate that I'm telling you to. So you can rule out over sensing, but you have to be careful with it. And we'll go on to talk about the R on T phenomenon a little later. The second thing that can go wrong is a failure to capture. So in this, what you're seeing on the ECG is you are seeing a pacing spike and you may even see a QRS complex afterwards. But you either see a pacing spike with no QRS complex or if you do see a QRS complex, when you feel the pulse or you look at the arterial waveform, you're not getting a contraction. You don't actually get a beat with that. So what you're getting is essentially under pacing of the heart. It's not getting electromechanical capture. The usual problems for this are either that the wire is being displaced, and that's probably the commonest cause, or the output's too low. The threshold potential has increased. Now that could be again because the wire is moved or because over time, the amount of electricity you need to stimulate the heart slowly goes up as the heart becomes acclimatized to it. And the final thing is that the cables are disconnected um, such that it's intermittently giving pacing or they're in the wrong ports and so the stimulation pattern that the generator is giving is not appropriate for the chamber that's being paced. So did you think about things like um, fibrosis of the wire myocardium interface? Now this can be just through continuous stimulation or it could be due to the patient having a massive MI. And so the area of tissue that's being paced is actually now totally ischemic. Always think about electrolyte imbalances. And when you've got a patient who's got temporary pacing, you have to be fastidious with your electrolyte management. I generally tend to set targets of 4.5 to 5 for your potassium, above 1.2 millimoles per litre for your magnesium, and an ionised calcium above 1.2 millimoles per litre. The reason it's important is if you remember back to, say, for example, hyperkalemia, what you get with hyperkalemia in terms of the ECG changes are t the T waves can become very tall. And if you've sens set your sensitivity such that the pacing box is actually now detecting those T waves and thinking, oh, that's another QRS complex, you can fool the pacemaker into thinking that the patient's got a higher intrinsic rate than they really do. So if you do see that, really be careful because um, those sorts of electrolyte abnormalities can cause problems with electrical capture. Also, things like hypocalcemia can cause there to be a electromechanical dissociation of the heart so that the stimulation isn't actually producing a heartbeat. So for all of these things, be careful and always normalise your electrolytes, top up your magnesium, top up your calcium if you need to. There are certain drugs that can decrease the sensitivity of the heart to electrical stimulation, things like lidocaine, beta blocks and verapamil. So if the patients are being given those things, now it's unlikely that they will be, but they could, um, then again, you've got to be really careful. And 
The usual reason why patients may sometimes be given these drugs is if they've got things like tachybrady syndromes or if they've got, they're have got they degenerating into malignant arrhythmias and they're intolerant of other drugs such as amiodarone. So if you do have them, do think about that and then manage that appropriately, either by reducing the dose or discussing with the cardiologist for an alternative drug. Now, like I say before, the thing that most people struggle to sort of conceptualise is the, the so-called oversensing, but it's really simple. All this is, is that the pacemaker generator is thinking that the electrical activity it's seeing is that it is the intrinsic heart rate. And it's usually that it's either picking up the T wave as opposed to the R wave, or that it's picking up extraneous noise from other muscle contractions, such as the diaphragm or the chest wall muscles. So what you're getting is inappropriate inhibition of the pacemaker. And by inappropriately inhibiting it, you're going back to your intrinsic rate. You're not pacing adequately. It could be due to large P waves or T waves, and this is where electrolyte management is really important. It could also be due to skeletal muscle movement, and I've seen it on a couple of occasions where they've set the sensitivity too high, and so it's starting to pick up electrical activity in the muscles. Now, in those particular cases, we needed a slightly higher sensitivity, and so actually the treatment in that case was to paralyse the patient, at least in the interim, till we got things sorted out. And by paralysing the patient, you get rid of those electrical um, movements from the um, myocardial contractions. And the final thing is always think about the leads and think about lead contact. It's not uncommon for the leads to move. And if the lead wasn't sitting properly and then suddenly started sitting more um, well against the my ventricular myocardium, you might start to get higher voltages and therefore the sensing that you'd set before is not appropriate for now. So the management's fairly simple with this. Decrease the pacing output to begin with. Um, sometimes the pacing output itself could be stimulating the diaphragm or the pectoral muscles, which is what's being detected as extraneous um, electrical noise. That may or may not be possible. Increase the absolute sensitivity, i.e. make it harder to inhibit, and that's probably the first thing that I would do. And then, if all else fails, consider going back to the VOO. This is where you're pacing the ventricle, but you're not sensing anything, so there's nothing to inhibit. So you get rid of this over-sensing immediately. But again, be careful doing that because of the so-called R on T phenomenon. So what is the R on T phenomenon? Well, here you can see a P, QRS, and T. The QRS is the electrical depolarization of the ventricle. And then from the R to the T, what you're getting is repolarization of ventricular cells. And that happens at different rates for different ventricular cells. You can see here, you've got another P, QRS. And just as you're getting the T, you get a pacing spike. Now, what happens here is you're stimulating the ventricular um, muscles. But some of the muscles, the cells, haven't repolarized, and some have. So the ones that have repolarized are ready to have another beat, so they can have another QRS complex. Whereas there are other bits that haven't repolarized, and so will not get stimulated. So you get this discordant stimulation of certain bits of the ventricular myocardium, but not others. And so you can get ectopic areas of automaticity, and this can generate ventricular tachycardias, which you're seeing here, or you can get VF, ventricular fibrillation. And it's because you've stimulated the heart during its repolarization time. And this is the whole reason why we sense with the pacing boxes, because we want to try and avoid this situation of the stimulation during the Q QT interval, the during the time at which the heart is repolarizing. And by setting something like VOO, you will get rid of the ability of the pacing box to sense it and therefore increase the risk of developing the R on T phenomenon. So in terms of final tips, what do I do when I see a patient at the start of a ward round in the days when I used to do night shifts, when I'd see the patient at the start of my night shift? 
I'd always have a look at the last chest x-ray. Check the lead placement. You'll be surprised how often the leads look like they've moved. Now, if all the settings have stayed the same, that's fine, but it's worth repeating the chest x-ray. I check all the lead connections myself from the pacing generator box through to the um, wire itself and just make sure they're on all nice and tight. Again, you'll be surprised how often they're sort of sticking a slightly out at an angle or they're not properly seated in the pacing generator box or at the side of the pacing wires. Check the threshold potential. This is where you drop down the output until you start to lose electromechanical capture and see what that is. That threshold potential should stay roughly the same, plus or minus 10 to 20 percent. Um, if it's changed more than that, do think about the fact that the leads may have moved and have a low threshold to investigate for that with an x-ray echo and talking to your friendly cardiologist. Always check the underlying rhythm. Easiest way to do this is by dropping down the heart rate until you start to see the intrinsic rate coming in. Don't be afraid to go down to 30 or 30 beats per minute slowly. You might see the blood pressure drop. That's because the cardiac output is dropping as the heart rate drops. However, often what you find is that if patients are in their sinus rhythm, their cardiac output might increase and the heart, rate, heart the blood pressure might actually jump even though the heart rate has dropped. The reason for this is atrial contraction contributes between 20 and 30 percent of cardiac output. So with each stroke volume, by having atrial kick, you're going to increase that stroke volume by 20 or 30 percent. That's really important. And so if you can get a patient into sinus rhythm, that is always better than ventricular pacing as long as the rate is adequate to maintain a cardiac output for the patient. So note what the underlying rhythm is. Is it asystole? If it's asystole, then they are 100% dependent on that pacemaker box and people need to be very careful of it. If the patient's got an underlying rate and say it's 40 or 50, it's just not fast enough for the patient to be able to maintain adequate cardiac output, you can be a little bit more relaxed. Now the final thing and the mistake that I see very commonly is that people run these patients too dry. Now you need to assess to see whether what the cardiac output is like for different heart rates. So I tend to use heart rate 70, 80 and 90 and I see what happens to the blood pressure if I've got cardiac output monitoring looking at that. Now some patients become very dependent on heart rate and especially those patients who have fixed cardiac output state. But what you also find is that if you've dried out a patient too much, they require that slightly higher heart rate because their stroke volume has dropped. They need the higher heart rate to keep their cardiac output the same. So if you find that they are becoming very heart rate dependent on their blood pressure or cardiac output, check to see what their intravascular volume status is. I do that by eyeballing an echo. I echo most patients most times. I see them just to keep an eye on what's going on and to get a general idea of what they're like. And if they do require um, that fast heart rate to maintain cardiac output and their intravascular deplete, give them fluid. The final thing is, if all else fails, if this all sounds too complicated and the patient's not pacing adequately with transvenous pacing, do not be afraid to put some pads on and to transcutaneously pace them until you get senior help. That is always the default position. It's in ALS because it's a simple thing to do, so always do it. And in order to find out how to do it, go back to my video on electrical pacing and I go through step by step how to set a patient up on transcutaneous pacing and about the considerations for sedation and so on. So I hope you found that useful and if you have, please like and subscribe to the channel. I'll be producing a lot more videos about hemodynamics and cardiac output in the future.